One of the interesting things with investments, and we're going to discuss, our next panel will discuss investments in the regions. Um, there is a difference between mathematics and investments. And I'm going to demonstrate this very quickly. So imagine there is a huge multi-million dollar prize, and there are three doors to choose from. Okay? It's very important. There are three doors to choose from. You'll choose one in your head. Now what I will do is that I will open one of the doors to show that it's not that door. Your decision that you have to make is, do I change my choice or do I stick? How many people want to stick with the choice they started with? Well, they don't know that. I don't know. <laughs> so how many people want to stick? How many people want to switch? Switch? Okay. I can see that there are definitely more engineers from this region. The correct answer, it's a mathematical answer, is always switch. It's a free choice again. So there's a 65% chance that it is in the other area. So if you're faced with this mathematic problem, always switch. This is not the case with investments. And by the way, shh, shh, please be considerate for others. Thank you. Choosing an investor is not the same thing as a mathematics problem. These things are long-term relationships. I think it's going to be very interesting for the panel here. Our next panel is discussing investments in the region, so very important for you all. So I'd like to invite Angel and the panelists to come up on stage. Many thanks. Welcome. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us today. Uh, the purpose of the panel basically is to present quickly Endeavor and also talk about uh, different types of companies and their experience with uh, raising global, local, and no capital at all. Uh, I'll take a few minutes just to very quickly brief you on what Endeavor is all about. Uh, it's a global nonprofit organization based out of New York, and we are active in 25 countries. In essence, it's a network of very high profile entrepreneurs from very dif different industries that um, bring together um, very considerable resources in order to support companies in those specific geographies uh, to scale up. Uh, Endeavor Bulgaria is one of the latest additions to the Endeavor network. We just opened an office in, uh, in Bulgaria in June of last year. And uh, we're the third country in, Bulgaria, in uh, Europe to do so. Um, Endeavor as an organization helps uh, high-impact entrepreneurs in three main areas. Access to markets, access to capital, and access to talent. All of this is basically briefed out on our website, so I'm not going to take too much time to uh, discuss this. But without further ado, I'll just um, set up the stage a bit on who is here and what we're going to discuss today. So the speakers that we have today here hardly need any introduction, especially in Bulgaria, but for those of you who are guests to our country, uh, I'll just uh, say a few words um, about each and every one of them. So yesterday I was thinking about our little panel, and I imagined it as a little bit as a Rubik's Cube. So imagine three companies that are represented. The first has raised global capital, the second has raised local capital, and the third has one has raised no capital at all. And then on the other hand, there's like a third kind of component to the equation. So the first company, uh, Vasil, who is the uh, CIO of Progress Software, uh, he is on the board of Endeavor Bulgaria. Lubu, who represents Melissa Climate, uh, a local startup in the IoT space, is in the, um, we call it the candidate program of Endeavor. And Dobri, who is the co-CEO and co-founder of Imperial Online, the most successful gaming studio in Bulgaria, is currently at the last stage of selection of Endeavor, and we'll be presenting the company in Madrid at the end of next month. Um, I'll first ask them to uh, tell us very briefly about themselves and about their specific company, so that for those of you who are not familiar with uh, those entities, you kind of get the, the, the gist of it. So, uh, Vasco, if you could Hi, tell us. My name is Vasil Terziev. Um, I'm best known as the co-CEO and co-founder of uh, Teleric, one of the bigger software companies in the region, which uh, 
exited in 2014 uh, for 262 million to Progress Software, a US publicly listed company where I work today as Chief Innovation Officer. Uh, it was a great journey from uh, four friends starting a company to raising capital to growing internationally, becoming a 750 plus person organization to uh, an exit to a US public company and nowadays being able to drive uh, strategy and be responsible for our uh, efforts in the digital transformation space as part of uh, a bigger company. So mm. lots to share and that's one of the reasons why I'm really happy to be part of Endeavor because all of that experience I can relay to other companies who are on the track of uh, growth and uh, to whom I can help in a smaller or bigger way. Mm -hmm. How about Lubo? Can you tell us a bit about the company and uh, your role and its past and future? Just kind of set up the stage. Sure. Um, so Melissa is a startup in IoT uh, space here in Bulgaria. Um, we are extremely focused on smart heating and cooling. So we want to introduce devices that make your heating and cooling smart. We already have our flagship product, which sells currently in 13 countries. Uh, we entered mass production a couple of weeks ago, and everything's great, basically. We raised some local, a lo a local capital uh, in order to introduce the product to other markets. And actually, that's a secret, but uh, in six months, we're going to have one more product. Exciting. Very exciting, indeed. Don't what forget about it. Hello from me too, I'm Dobroslav Dimitrov. As uh, already said, I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Imperia Online, a web-based and mobile game uh, developer with 11 years of history. Uh, currently we employ 160 people here in uh, Sofia. We founded the company with a gigantic investment of $1,000 uh, to buy the first server, which was a desktop computer. And uh, we haven't invested a single dime after that. That includes uh, our own money. We've never borrowed money. We never put our own money into the business after that. The only thing we invested was our time. So, uh, well, it worked out pretty nice for us. The other thing that uh, we're quite proud of is that three years ago, we founded a free academy for uh, developers called IT Talents, uh, which in very short time, in five months, can actually uh, create a junior developer from zero. And uh, currently, most of our developers, like over 85% of our developers in our company, are graduates of uh, this academy. The academy serv uh, services right now over 60 other IT companies in Bulgaria. So it's not just for Imperia Online, it's for about 60 other companies that uh, uh, interview, hire, and uh, develop their businesses thank thanks to that program. So that's my other mm -hmm. business card. As you probably guessed by now, Endeavor works with a wide array of companies across different sectors and across uh, different area, I mean, uh, stages of development. Um, being in 25 countries actually gives us a very unique position to be a driving force in developing and emerging markets, as is Bulgaria. Uh, so far, Endeavor as an organization has supported uh, more than 800 companies with, with 1,300 entrepreneurs. Uh, we, just for 2014, we raised about 530 million US uh, we, between the different companies that we support. We have in our network about 4,000 mentors across different areas and in different industries and with different uh, areas of expertise. And uh, basically, within our portfolio, there's companies that account for uh, 500,000 jobs worldwide. So just wanted to kind of set up the stage on the kind of the subsequent uh, discussion that we're going to have today. Uh, I wanted to, to follow up with a, a very brief, brief question about uh, Endeavor and your motivation to be engaged in some capacity uh, with the organization because your roles are very different, obviously. Maybe, Vasco? Well, my, my role as a member of the board is to really relay, as I said, my experience to guys like Lubo, uh, to Dobri to help them with what I know, with my network, with my knowledge, so that they can build bigger, better companies and really surpass anything that was done uh, before them. And it's a real pleasure to be working with guys like them. How about Lou? What is what has been your motivation so far in terms of uh, being engaged with Endeavor in some capacity? 
Well, okay, everybody knows the successful examples in every country for entrepreneurs. Um, my way of thinking is, if I want to get access to those entrepreneurs, the best ones in each and every country that entrepreneur has offices in, well, endeavor is the way. So if I got to sh say it shortly, access to markets and extreme potential. Mm. Uh, well, we have a long history. We've been around for 11 years, and when we were starting, uh, there were no uh, 11, there was no launch hub, there, is no, there was no VCs in, uh, nobody pretty much knew what a VC in Bulgaria was. So the ecosystem did not exist in general. And I'm pretty certain this has hindered our uh, development in the first four or five years. Uh, so now that we have access to such ecosystems, it only makes sense to be part of them because uh, we compete on the global market and uh, there is only so many people you can meet in, uh, in your media circle of uh, people you know. So uh, the more access you have to contacts, it's a great multiplier to your business. So to me, it definitely makes sense to be part of something like that. Thank you. Uh, before we move into a deeper dive on each of the specific companies, I just wanted to share uh, two very high profile examples of Endeavor success. The first one is very close to uh, our country in Turkey. Last year, Yem Accepti, a uh, food delivery company, uh, which is uh, also an Endeavor company, which was supported for about six years through the Endeavor network, got sold to Delivery Hero for about 590 million. And that marked the largest online exit in Turkey. And in 2014, we actually had our first company um, list itself on the New York Stock Exchange out of Argentina. So these are just very high, you know, uh, high profile examples of uh, the value added that uh, the organization has had so far. Uh, moving on to the deeper dive with this specific company. So first, uh, with Basil from Telerik, um, as you, most of you probably know, uh, the company was supported by Summit, uh, Summit Partners. And I wanted to find out from, kind of from the kitchen, so to speak, how did you decide to work with Summit in the first place? I'm sure you had plenty of options. Yeah, well, the, the, the first uh, decision point was whether to work at all with a VC or not. Then mm. it was, should it be Summit or some of the other companies that were approached. Uh, luckily, we were very fortunate to, uh, to have built a business outside of the boundaries of Bulgaria. And even since the early days, 60% of our revenue was uh, driven in the US. So we were attending conferences. We were pretty well, well known. And you know how it works. Analysts from those companies, they look around on the web at events, they see who's attracting uh, food traffic, and they approach you. So for many years, we were approached, but we didn't know what those people could help us with. So we were rude enough not to return calls, not <laughs> to, uh, to talk to them. But at some point, we were a hundred and something person company uh, doing very decent bookings, very profitable. But we hit another problem. It was not the lack of capital. It was not the lack of markets. It was uh, the lack of managerial experience, the lack of uh, knowledge around many things. So we had to make a big choice. Are we going to continue to run this, uh, as we like to joke, as cowboys, uh, as um, a hobby business? Or we're going to take the track of building a professional company, really uh, building a big, uh, good uh, business? And we opted for the second second one. So that's, that's the point where we said, OK, well, how can uh, investors help us with that respect? Mm -hmm. And what are the characteristics of a good partner? That's when we went on to talk to some of those companies that had approached us, talk to some others who had not, and ultimately ended up with, uh, with Summit Partners. Tell us a bit about the process. I mean, what are the highlights of the process? And what, what is it that you learned that you never expected that came out, that stood out uh, as part of the process? Well, the, the major thing is, uh, as uh, the opening comment was that it's not just a math thing. It's uh, math counts. But ultimately, you see that most people do the math pretty similarly. And mm -hmm. it's really about the people, the chemistry. Uh, how are you going to get along with those other guys? And it's a very human-centric thing. Right. Uh, because uh, there are ups and downs in every relationship. Uh, there is no such thing as five, six, seven years of a company growing up rapidly and you not having any fights in the, in the boardroom, having disagreements over strategy, over capital allocation. 
that's non-existent. So the, the only thing that matters is what type of people you have in the boardroom so that you can get through those challenges uh, intelligently. Uh, and from the, from the first day, we really looked for uh, a fit in terms of, uh, of people, and we looked for one key characteristic, uh, which is integrity. And we spent a lot of time talking with people who have raised capital, who had raised capital from each of the uh, companies uh, that we talked to, and we looked for those characteristics where we saw a meeting of the of, of the minds. And then you know all the all the mechanics they're pretty similar for a company our stage. It was a long, tedious uh, process after we signed the LOI. Basically, the, the whole uh, the whole thing paid off. Uh, just by virtue of the due diligence process because it gave us a multi-year roadmap what we need to fix. There was right. like seven pages of bullets and each of those bullets required hundreds of pages of additional information. So it quickly showed us what we're not doing, what we should be doing, what's more important than other stuff and um, that's how it started. And it was great that it forced us from, I from the due diligence process to really start operating or aspiring to operate as a mature uh, company, which is something that we would have very, very, you know, hardly reached ourselves. And there's a lot of benefits of attracting capital outside of this, but, you know, yeah. probably you have follow-on questions, so I don't <laughs> want to have, like, a long <laughs> monologue. I have plenty of questions, but you mentioned that uh, the, the structure and the valuation is pretty much consistent across the board between the different VCs. Uh, there was a bit more about that um, how, how did you basically figure it all out in terms of like the, the lingo, in terms of the, the terms, in terms of the standard provisions that they seem standard to people who have been doing this for 15 years, but probably they weren't particularly standard to you. For somebody who had never seen an LOI in their life, it was so much uh, legal language that you can't absorb. That did you work with advisors or just kind of wing it? In the beginning, we didn't. It was us reading the LOIs until we figured out what we want to do. Uh, and that's another selection criteria that, that we used. Who's VC? Uh, the, the, the term sheet of what VC is simplest to understand. Mm -hmm. The more we could understand, the higher it scored. So it's pre pretty simple. Yeah, uh, decision like making. A yeah. Good and litmus test. And later on, we hired a legal uh, company in Bulgaria and in the States to represent us and to be a counterpart of uh, mm. the VC that we decided uh, to work with. So it was, it was very daunting. Mm. To Dobry's point, I mean, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been quite, of a, quite a bit of development in terms of local ecosystem, capital providers. We see the accelerators, we see the co-investment funds, we see other vehicles. Um, do you think that, first of all, raising capital is right for everyone? And do you think that for Bulgarian companies, most of them are looking for capital? Could, are, are they competitive enough to raise global capital? Basically, would some, I mean, will sometimes the right answer be to raise capital locally and then transition? Or I actually think it's, it's a, there, there's no right or wrong answer to this one. It's all a function of um, what you are doing well as a company, what are your aspirations? If you, uh, the one thing to remember about VC capital is that it's expensive money. It doesn't come free. Sure. Yeah, it's not, it's not charity. So you gotta have a very good idea of how it's gonna create even more value by you uh, taking it. What oh, are you gonna, gonna scale? Do you have a business model that's good enough as a foundation to scale or do you not? And if you do, then what's the right amount? What are the terms? What you know is the um, offset between the different rounds? Uh, as, as you've seen with Dobry's company, they were pretty successful without raising any capital. There are other examples. So it's really knowing about your business, your challenges, your needs, and uh, that intersecting with, with the right moment. So with your vast experience when it comes to international capital raising, what are the kind of the gold nuggets that you would share with the audience today in terms of like, these are the three key things that you should look out for that you should kind of analyze before and once you start that process? Well, the one thing that definitely helps is if you go to the places where you're likely to bump into an investor, meaning industry events, other things where you can 
w where you can see those people, especially industry events, because they, that, that's one of the ways in which they do research. The other thing is to really build a company that is differentiated and which creates value. Small, big, if you're differentiated and you stand out compared to the others, they quickly find you. you mi it might be too early for them to invest in you, but you would get those conversations. The, ol the only thing you have to avoid is just sitting down uh, in your ivory tower, doing your product, not talking to people, not being known, because in that way you can't find customers and you can't find investors. You need to mingle with other people. Mm. Uh, my last question. It, it's very simple, but we didn't do it for a number of years, and I see a lot of people not doing it as well. So, My last question to you actually uh, goes back to Endeavor. How do you think Endeavor as an organization could address those things that you just mentioned in terms of getting access, getting exposure, getting to, uh, you know, to ask the right questions and so on? Well, in this, in this respect, Endeavor, Endeavor gives a lot, and it's a great uh, instrument for companies who are still unsure should they take capital, should they not, but you know, want to get a feel of this, want to get uh, an extended uh, network. And uh, it would have been great if in our time such an instrument existed. So the one thing that Endeavor definitely helps is with, uh, with instilling better discipline in, in companies, helping them organize uh, things, structure them well, opening up new doors in terms of the great network across all those 25 uh, countries, and then helping them prepare for future fundraising uh, events. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to, to Lulu, um, tell us a bit about your experience. I mean, it's a vastly different experience. It's uh, here on the local scene with, uh, with investors that we all know, Eleven and, and Rostin. Uh, tell, tell us about your kind of, um, the, what you picked up from that process and how you decided you know, to follow that process in the first place. Well, very shortly, the, the whole process was the following. We had a different idea. It, uh, it was about smart home again, but not about cooling or heating, but the whole idea. I, I mean, I wanted to automate everything in your home. So, <clears throat> Eleven, being in Launch Hub, being, being one of the you know, most known um, uh, startup accelerators right now, uh, I applied for Eleven and got an interview. At the interview, they told me, Lubo, you have to focus on, keep on cooling and heating. There is potential. But I say no. Uh, we just proceeded with our team. Uh, we built in the product and not focusing on actually selling it to the customer. Uh, I mean, we did exactly the things you mentioned not to do. Um, afterwards, we decided to start selling. And we realized that the, pro that the product that we had wasn't selling. And then we were on a cross path. Where should we go? Cooling, heating, comfort, what? So we decided to test each and every product. And one of about cooling uh, sold the most. Basically, we just made fake prototypes and we're going around uh, different businesses to sell them to them. Mm -hmm. uh, when we saw the potential, we decided to raise money because we, need, uh, we, we knew that we need them um, for our production. I can explain the story in a very romantic way with our investors, mm -hmm. but basically we have Eleven and we have Roslyn. Uh, Roslyn I met in a very strange way. Basically a friend of mine told me, hey, I have the right investor for you. I didn't know who they are, but uh, the thing that really impressed me was that at the first meeting with them, we didn't talk much about the business. We talked about us, I mean, about the founders. Obviously they knew this is the most important thing. Um, and you know, the second, the second meeting was horrible for us. I mean, all kinds of questions, how are you gonna do it? How are you gonna find, find us this? But basically, we have raised two rounds. Mm -hmm. The first one was just to prove them our loyalty and the fact that we are going to make it. Uh, the first round was uh, 50K Euro, followed by another 50K in the same round, uh, a couple of months afterwards. Uh, and then we raised half a million. Mm -hmm. And right now we are here. So tell us about the, the process specifics. I mean, for example, the valuation process, I imagine that given that there's not very many service providers of that nature in Bulgaria, it wasn't particularly standard. There wasn't like a, the valuation approach that you would typically follow in much larger markets. Like how did you decide on valuation? How did you decide on, on different rights of the investors and stuff like that? Yeah. Did you use an advisor? How did that pan out? 
I would say it was a gut feeling. Basically, uh, our evaluation and their evaluation, uh, just some in some magical way, they just met in the middle. However, I mean, I don't really understand early stage startups arguing about valuations. I mean, if you haven't proven that this product will sell, then why arguing about the valuation? You just gotta take, if you know that this is the right investor for you, you gotta take the chance. Okay, um, tell us, I mean, many founders uh, actually hate fundraising, right? When they start fundraising, pretty much everything else is put on hold, the business stops, and they are taken out of their comfort, comfort zone like in a very, very serious manner. And how, did you, how were you able to manage this process on your end? I mean, I'm sure that you had plenty of other things going on at the same time, right? Well, um, I got also on co-founders. <laughs> right. So they managed to um, bring the business forward while I was raising the money. However, fundraising is a full-time job. I mean, if you want to do it, yeah, you got to do it for, I don't know, two, three months, but it's full-time. You got to do it all the time. Uh, with us, it was, I mean, the, the first stage was, it's, it was a new thing for all the founders, but the second stage was really easy. I mean, we, we have managed to reach our targets, our milestones, and our investors knew that we're gonna need some more money. They just waited for us to tell them how much we're gonna need and what we're gonna do with them. Mm -hmm. But um, tell us about your experience, w you know, working with those investors. I'm, sh I'm sure you've had plenty of, um, how do I say it, um, difficult discussions, they just use the politically correct term, difficult discussions with investors. How do you manage those? Do you, how do you come to terms, basically? Because when you put people of strong opinions in the same room, how do you manage that process? Well, the thing is that I believe I, I don't have a, just investors. I have mentors. Basically, yeah, of course, I listen to them. Um, I, I take into consideration they, their opinion. At the end of the day, of course, it's the founder's um, um, decision that is going to um, be, I, I'm not sure if it's the right one, but yeah, of course, we're gonna decide at the end. But um, when you're getting an investor, I mean, if there are any startups right now in the stage, uh, in the room, if you try to find an investor, try to find one that you have some, you know, chemical connection with. Um, meaning, it shouldn't just bring money on the table and connections. It should bring mentorship as well. The reason why I'm asking this question is many companies that are uh, debating whether or not they should attract an investor, their first concern is basically, so far, we're super lean and mean, we take decisions like this, no one basically is in our business. Once and if we bring in an investor, um, things change dramatically and someone always breathes down our neck. Have you felt that at all in any way? Or if you have, yeah. has that been a concern? Well, um, investor is a good thing. I mean, breathing in somebody's neck is a good thing because um, basically what, what they want from you is for you to reach your milestones, to reach your targets. And of course, if you expect nobody to, to expect this from you, it's kind of strange. Uh, it's been two years so far, almost two, year, two years since we got the first investment and we haven't had a single fight, I mean a real fight with our investors. Uh, we always uh, come to a decision where we all feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Would you do something differently looking back? I mean, uh, it seems that so far things are going more or less according to plan. Is there something that you've learned along the way that you would kind of turn back time and change? Well, in the fundraising process, no, no way. But in the business itself, I would have uh, invested a bit more money uh, up front. I mean, the first round should have been a bit bigger in order to reach the mass manufacturing faster. Because mm. we, while we were developing the product, there were, of course, competitors. Uh, right now, we are crushing them. I mean, we are right now the leaders on this market. But if we were with the product uh, on the market like six months faster, well, no competition then. Great. Uh, moving on with, over to, to Dobri. Um, as, as I pointed out, I mean, Imperial Online is the most successful gaming company in Bulgaria. Uh, they've uh, done something, they're one of the very few product companies in Bulgaria in the first place. 
but uh, they've actually done quite a number of things so far. I mean, Dory mentioned the academy, uh, and then uh, most recently you started working on Imperial Mobile. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, starting from where Vasco started about when they had to make the choice whether to be cowboys or corporate, our choice is basically always <laughs> go cowboys. <laughs> this is our way of doing stuff, and this is why we can make decisions very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, when we founded the Academy, for example, we suddenly found ourselves with the abundance of great developers, which there's only so many you can use in a product company. Where a product company is just like, you know, when you're building a well, you can't build it with a thousand people, you build it with a few people. So with the extra developers, we decided instead of uh, uh, bypassing them, instead to actually found a new company. Mm -hmm. When you don't have an investor where you have to judge, um, justify your decision, why a product company is doing an outsource company and is doing an academy for developers, right. you actually can take decisions like that because we only answer to ourselves. So this is advantage. Uh, I believe raising capital shouldn't be a self-serving uh, purpose. You, you don't, uh, this is not the only way. It's not, well, I have a startup, and uh, along the way, I have to raise capital somewhere along. No, you don't. You need to know exactly what you want to do. If you're going for the big exit, yes, you need to raise capital because you need people to introduce you to uh, the circles for the exit and so forth. If you want to develop a great product and that's the one thing that's driving you and you're doing it well, perhaps you don't need to raise that capital. Okay. So you need to ask yourself the question every day, what do I want for me? What do I want for the company? and then the answer will come by itself. It seems that you're in a very good spot right now. I mean, you and your co-founder, Moni, uh, you basically have developed a product company. You've developed a uh, more or less learning institution, which largely complements uh, the Bulgarian institutions that seem to be inadequate when it comes to technical education. And now you have closed the circle with, um, with an outsourcing entity. So you're pretty much fully integrated, it seems. How did you get here without capital, and what would be the next step for you? Well, uh, we have this very uh, formula for success we like. Uh, there are three things. You uh, need money, you need contacts, and you need the right decisions. But actually, that's not. And if you don't have the first two, you better make the right decisions. <laughs> well, that's how we got here. We, we made the right decisions. The fact is, if you have money, you might lose them, and you won't have money anymore. If you have contacts, you might lose them because you did something stupid and people don't want to pick up the phone on you anymore. So the one thing you can't lose is your right decisions. You have to uh, analyze where you're at. The market changes all the time. 11 years when we were starting had nothing to do with today. We had to change our business model uh, maybe four or five times in the past 10 years. Basically, every two years, we had to reinvent the company. So. This is, the, this is the way to do it, and that's how you can continue succeeding. There is not a single advice. The advice is be aware. You mentioned something in the introduction about the rising investment ecosystem. You mentioned that that might have some, somewhat inhibited your growth. Do you believe that? Do you think, w would you have done something differently if you could turn back the time in terms of attracting an investor early on and scaling the company more substantially early on? Well, if we had the, the ecosystem we have now, right. back then, I'm pretty certain we uh, would have uh, gotten here much quicker. It wouldn't have taken us 11 years, it would have taken us five or six years. This is the reason why we try to be as active as possible, help the next startups after us, because there's no point in them losing four or five or six years learning the lessons we learned by ourselves. So yes, if we had the ecosystem, we'd have probably done it in half the time. Right. And now that the ecosystem is here, uh, do you have any plans to follow that route? Or how, how basically do you perceive this? Well, I totally believe that this is how it works. Uh, I, I believe that the economy of Bulgaria is actually going to change in the next couple of years dramatically thanks to this thing. It's, mm -hmm. that, it's that big. And it's happening right now with the, with the appearing of um, the accelerators, which started hundreds of small companies. Some of them will start succeeding in this uh, gravity of successful companies are pushing the, the economy forward and the entire industry. Teleric, of course, is like our torch light. They're way ahead of everyone else, but this, this is the example, the good example. Uh, just like they did with the, their own software academy, which they uh, founded, the Teleric Academy. This is the good examples that they catch, catch on. And 
the more people see good examples, the quicker they advance. Because usually you can't believe something is possible unless you've seen somebody do it. Right. Now we have a lot of examples, and uh, more and more people start believing that, yes, we can. Yes, we can found a company. Yes, we can find somebody to support us. And yes, we can make it to the global market. So this, yeah. is, this is what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Makes a lot of sense. My last question to you actually, again, goes back to Endeavor. Uh, speaking of positive examples and right examples, I firmly believe this is critically important. What has been your experience in the last few months uh, that you have started working with, with our organization? Have you uh, identified such examples? Have you made any progress in that, uh, in that arena? And what are your hopes kind of going forward in this, in this area? Well, the funny thing is that uh, we've been around for 11 years. And I keep finding colleagues that have also been around for 11 years, and we don't know each other. Local? We're like local, yes. We're like a couple of hundreds of companies at, at the most. And the product companies are probably 10, 15, 20. And we don't know each other. Mm. That's something that is really hindering everyone's uh, development. Because when you don't know who to call and ask for advice, or maybe you find something that the two companies can do together and grow together. But unless we meet, we don't know about each other. And it's a very strange fact. I guess our um, industry in general is trying to stay under the radar. People don't like to be too expressive, too outside in the open. And a lot of the times, we don't even know these companies exist. We have incredibly successful companies of Bulgaria that no one knows about. And uh, these kind of um, forums, these kind of ecosystems help us get together and find what we can do together to go on the global market. Because 100 Bulgarian companies com compete with the 100,000 world companies. So the only way we can actually be competitive is if we meet each other and we can help each other and give advices. I mean, no one has developed the wheel and everyone else doesn't know about it. I mean, it's like you can't be this. Uh, the only one has thought of something. So better share that, share that knowledge. Better bounce your ideas with as many people as possible because they will give you the right feedback so you can make it to the big stage. So to me, this is the right way to go. And I advise anybody that is wondering whether to be part of something like that to, uh, to join. The more, the better. Thank you. With, with that, I want to turn it over to uh, just maybe one question uh, from the public. We run a bit over time. Any, any questions that, uh, now is the time. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Miguel. I just want to continue what just Dobry said about uh, the IT companies knowing each other and how they can get together and find out what other companies do and find synergy among them. Can you give us examples or your ideas how this process can be, um, can speed up and more companies be more transparent to the whole public and to each other? Well, yes, the simplest one, for example, would be we should all, for example, join our uh, organization such as Bascom, for example, which turned out it only a fraction of the companies are members of that organization. We ourselves were not members until two years ago, which was ridiculous. Uh, so this is the simplest of example. They should be participating in, uh, in the mentor programs of um, Eleven and uh, Lunch, Hub, uh, Lunch Hub. They should be uh, doing what Endeavor is doing. I mean, we need to go to the places where we all uh, collect. The fact is, we don't. Only a couple of dozens of companies do it. The rest of the companies actually stay on the sidelines. So this is an example. There are already a lot of forums we can meet, but somehow a lot of the people don't find that, uh, that uh, there is added value to it. So that's my advice. There's plenty of places to meet, just we need to be a bit more proactive. Thank you very much.